I'm Felicity Starr and I'm predominantly a still life oil painter. Hello and welcome to the Art Podcast, where we get to know women from around the world of visual arts. I'm Chris Stafford and this is Season 2, Episode 9. My guest this week is Felicity Starr, a contemporary realism artist who seeks to celebrate life and excite the soul through her paintings, which portray still life, landscapes and portraits. Felicity was born in Colchester, England in 1982, the eldest of three daughters to Steve and Fiona Menadou. Her father was in IT and Fiona was a stay-at-home mum. At the age of 14, Felicity's family moved to Paris and she attended the British School of Paris. She focused on politics and international studies as a foundation for her career, but instead found that she had a talent for sales. Whilst her career has taken her down that path, she's never stopped drawing and is mostly a self-taught artist. Her dedication to art, though, has been a constant source of solace and self-discovery, allowing her to navigate the unique challenges associated with dyslexia and ADHD. Felicity has shown her work at the Royal Society of British Artists, the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, the Royal Society of Marine Artists and the Society of Wildlife Artists. In 2003, she also exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition and Royal West Academy. Felicity combines her art with a full-time job in IT as VP at Salesforce. She's married to Richard, who also works in IT, and the couple live in Hampshire, England, with their two children, Annabelle and Charlie. Felicity, welcome to the Art Podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you are in a beautiful part of England, Fleet in Hampshire, which is just to the southwest uh, of London, for those who are not familiar with the geography there, but it is a beautiful part of England. I'm sure you're inspired by just your environment, aren't you, for your paintings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love nature like I'm sure we all do really and yeah you're quite right there's a fleet pond just down the road um which is about three kilometers circumference and it's full of wonderful spots to to look at admire and then also to to get your imagination working because you like to paint outside au plein air I do yes I I probably get the most enjoyment. Actually, there's no probable about it. I get the most pleasure in plein air painting outside in the environment. You know, they call it flow when you're completely consumed, um, enjoying the subject that you're considering and then translating into paint. Um, I also think it probably gives me the best education in terms of keeps my eye, you know, my skills sort of fresh. Um, But I must say, in terms of how people react to my work, people prefer my still life to to the plein air. So the plein air is more of a sort of self-education rather than the direction of my my work. If that makes any sense, I feel like I'm already waffling. We've only just got started. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, your painting has been described as very straightforward. Would that be how you would describe yourself personally? Are you a very straightforward person? And then is that your vision of the world? Yes, I think so. I I think that I'm quite black and white. I don't, I'm not blessed with a filter. So perhaps sometimes things that I say are very welcomed, you know, and cut cut through any any noise and then other times some things I'll say that might not be quite as welcome um but yeah I'm straightforward in terms of I know what I love I pretty much love everything um I enjoy people painting outdoors and um from a young age I wasn't very um good at writing um I 
diagnosed dys- dyslexic at, at a very young age and and and, and writing and, and reading was was very difficult so immediately I sort of started drawing and things and so there's a natural connection there to um to paint what I feel and what I see in a straightforward manner I don't try and make things um prettier or 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 change them from how they are in life I, I love to celebrate the object or the thing or the environment as is the only thing I do interject is is, is sort of narrative and I love symbolism I I adore stories within stories um so yes yeah, straightforward but with a bit of fun <laughs> Does that mean you have a sense of humour, Felicity? I imagine you do. Well, I think I'm hilarious. Um, my <laughs> children might not agree with me, but yeah, no, I think I'm a barrel of laughs. Um, but yeah, <laughs> are you the life and soul of the party? I'm told I am. I yeah, I have I have very high energy levels. Um, constantly, that's constantly brought up. I'm amazed that that's that you've already. Can you can you see? Can you hear that already? Well, let's unpack it a little bit more then. What do you do for fun? Uh, well, well, I paint. I paint for fun. I, I have a full-time job um, for various reasons, and um, I paint in my, in my should we say, spare time, which is any time that is, is free. Normally in the evenings when I've got the children to bed um, or at the weekends when they're at their various hobbies um sports things like that um and then holidays i i carry around a, an easel uh wherever i go and so the, my fr- my friends and family are, are very used to maybe we'll be at a barbecue and and i will be uh present and in the moment and chatting but i i will be standing there with an easel um because i also find it very difficult to sit still and um, I'm quite fidgety, so also painting is, is sort of turned out to be almost a bit of a a mechanism to keep me in the moment rather than 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 running off doing something else. I was talking to an artist the other day, Felicity, who during the course of the day she works all day. Uh, in, in during the day she will get up from time to time and she'll put the music on and she'll dance. All right. Nice just to release that energy and then go back to work. Would that appeal to you? Absolutely, yes. I, yes. I tend to get very fixated on songs for a period of time. It will be sort of one song that I'll play on repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And, um, yeah, yeah, definitely got up and danced. I danced a lot as a child. Um, yeah, I love having a jig around. Well, you mentioned that you started drawing from an early age because that was a very safe place for you to explore. Was that in colour as well? Did you add colour to your young life? That's an interesting question because somebody emailed me or messaged me on Instagram the other day uh, specifically about colour in terms of this lady was saying how she adores drawing but when she adds colour to it it all goes belly up and god that resonated with me so much because no I was just a drawer or a draftsman or woman however you say it I just would love to be with a pencil or a black pen um and that, yeah, that that was that's what I loved. I quite, I realised probably about sixteen that I needed to get into painting because I didn't see any drawings in museums. And whilst I was still unsure about where my life was going to take me, I. Um, I got so many thoughts, trains of thoughts at the same time. I was very aware that I don't want my life to be a waste, and I'm I'm very I'm scared of the thought of you know dying and being forgotten and not not making a mark, a positive mark on the world. And I would go to um, museums and I would see books and celebrated artists, and there was 
the drawing was almost always the prerequisite to a celebrated painting. So I told myself, if, if that's the direction I'm going to go in, then I'm going to need to, you know, quick, smart, get a, get a grip on, on painting and, and I sort of force myself to enjoy it because um, because I didn't think the drawing would get me there. Now, obviously, hindsight's a beautiful thing. And now that I'm, I'm well in, into my life and older, I can actually see that you can do whatever you want in life and you could you know, make a name for yourself, create, create a legacy uh, as a chap called Curtis, who does the most magnificent portraits in pencil and, and, and colored pencils. And, and they will never be forgotten. And, you know, and he is creating his legacy right now. But I guess at the time, as a younger person, I didn't think about breaking through those, those norms. What other artists were inspiring you then when you were younger? When I was younger, my sort of first love was Lucian Freud. Um, and again, I think that must have been about 16. I was very into Manet as well. And uh, we moved to France when I was younger. So, and I lived um, near Bougival, which is where a lot of the Impressionists live. And so it's, it's like known as the cradle of Impressionism. So by virtue of where I was, a lot of that sunk in. I loved the freedom of the the quick brush marks and the yeah, the energy that comes across. Um so yeah a, a lot of the impressionist work I did also very much like Rodin and then got to know Gwen John. Um and then as I've got older, Velasquez, um, Sorolo, who I can never pronounce, I always get that wrong, embarrassingly enough. And um, and any, anybody and everybody. And there's a lady, by the way, um, Heidi Jo uh, Summers, um, a contemporary um, artist. She is amazing. I don't think you've interviewed her yet, but you must reach out to her. She's, I sort of worship her. She's a bit of a heroine of mine. Now, your parents, were they at all influential in your creativity? I know uh, they divorced when you were 21, so you spent your childhood with them. Were, were they parents that l let you unpack your own creativity, or did they steer you in any way? Um, they did steer me out of love, and I think, I mean, I've always been a very happy person and I think they would say I was a happy child I was a bit of a handful though again I think the energy sometimes was a bit much um and I also had I was quite I was full of ideas and at one point I wanted to be a ballerina so I think it was quite exhausting for them really to keep track of everything I wanted to do and be and uh, wanted to do everything at my best possible level and be the best and all the rest of it. Um, and I think when it when it came to choosing universities and things, um, I, I went down the sort of academic route and read politics and international relations. And I was definitely encouraged to do that because my parents quite rightly wanted me to have a life ahead where I could get a job and, and have financial security. Um, you know, looking especially at that time, at what roles there would be for artists. It's, it didn't feel like it was a career that was a stable moneymaker, which was a priority um, at the time for my parents, for me to have. Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all of that stuff, it makes, it makes sense to me. You're the oldest of three girls. Were you competitive with your siblings? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were, we are, we've all gone down different routes um, and we adore each other. Um, so we were competitive, but in a, in a very fun, close way. My middle sister is a sports junkie. She's incredible. She can run ultra marathons. And then my, uh, the next, the younger sister is, um, she's a real, real academic. She's so clever. She's, she, I think she now writes policy for the government for environmental stuff, but 
I don't always listen to exactly what you're telling me because it's, um, it's very specific. Yeah. And was there oh, any... Oh, Shan said that. She's going to listen. I love you, Hetty. I love you, Lily. <laughs> you're, your jobs are amazing. And are they at all artistic? Uh, no. 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 no, so... no um, yeah, not from a, a, a drawing and painting perspective. No, nobody is. So where do you think this the, the, the time came in your young life where you thought this is actually something ultimately I want to do? Maybe not the first career, but something that I want to do uh, for, for the rest of my life, if I possibly can, if I marry the right man and find the right circumstances? <laughs> well, I never thought, oh, I, I guess the only way is just to be honest, but I never thought... And still, I mean, I've been on a journey. I have a pretty good on a journey. I mean, only in the last few years I've I had the confidence to call myself an artist. And and when you reached out to say, would you like to do this this podcast? You know, I was dancing around the house, singing, I've made it. Like, oh my goodness, I'm actually an artist. Because I haven't had the training. It was not something that... Uh, I don't want to say this and then make my parents sound bad because they're amazing um but I you know there's funny memories I did I did GCSE art and I did GCSE A level and I would always be in trouble because they would come into my room and I would lie and say that yeah no I'm I'm doing my English homework or I'm doing my maths and of course I never was because I would be drawing or doing another study or um so it's almost like I I quite quickly had to do my art in secret because I knew I wasn't allowed to be doing it. Nobody really did it. It then also wasn't cool to be doing it. Um, I have a remarkable best friend, uh, Lady Laura, uh, Lady called Laura, and uh, she was just, I mean, you know, she she helped make me, and, and she was so funny, she couldn't care less what's sort of cool or not cool, and we used to bunk off school quite a bit, and... You know, when you when you watch films or you look at people bunking off schools, they normally go and do really naughty things. But we would bunk off school to then go and sit on the um, bridges uh, in Paris on the Seine, on the River Seine, with our sketchbooks and draw the the the, the boats, you know, the scenery, the architecture, the landscapes. Um, and she and then when we went to university, she went up Durham and we would meet up and... Um, and she'd say, oh, let, you know, let's do some drawing. And and in my mind, I'd think, oh, my God, that's like the uncoolest thing to do. We should be in the pub drinking. Um, so she was always my anchor into drawing. And she said, hey, this must have been a throwaway comment. But her, she said once that her parents thought it was so nice that I still drew because they thought I was very good at it. Um, and I guess carried that with me as well. And then... I went into into my career and um, and then I found myself in times of worry or concern or, or challenges. I would find myself drawing. Um, again, I wouldn't show anybody. And I met my husband and I would draw his portrait, but I don't even know if he knew I was drawing his portrait. It's just I was sitting watching TV and I'd get, you know, really quite fidgety or bored, so... So I would do that. Um, I'm concerned I'm rabbiting on again. Can you keep me on task? I don't even know what I'm asked, answering, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> well, you were born in Colchester in, in, in Essex, but you moved to Paris when you were a young teenager, when you were just 14 years old. So what was the reason for that move? Was that your, your, your parents' work that took you there? Yes, yeah. So my dad works in IT or worked in IT, he's retired now, and uh, his job moved out there so we we moved with him and we're all really excited to do so um and yeah I went to French school for a bit I was um I was very hyper and I got myself into trouble a lot um and I what kind of trouble <laughs> just silly things just um just I you know, I found I found it very difficult to sit still, and you know, I just oh, I don't really, I'm embarrassed to say, but just just silly things like oh, you know, turning on the fire alarm, thinking it was funny, climbing on the roof, thinking it was funny. I didn't really. I have a very high risk profile, so what I think is 
funny is actually quite foolish. Um, and it got me into a lot of trouble anyway. I ended up going to the British School of Paris and they were amazing. That school is just the bee's knees. They they were very good in giving me enough freedom to be who I want to be. And then also, uh, you know, um, directing my 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 intellect, you know, because um, as, as an adult, I have been diagnosed actually with with ADHD, so it makes a lot of sense now. Everything, everything. Whereas beforehand, growing up, I, I guess I was just a bit challenging and and um, and excess energy and all of those usual things. Now I can understand that actually, not that it's an excuse, but just the way my brain is wired. I get very, very into things. I get very excited and passionate, and then things that don't really interest me it's almost painful to, to try and listen. And if somebody's wittering on about something that's not interesting, then, then, that, then that's very, very difficult for me to concentrate. So were you a daredevil then at school? In, in yes, yes, yes. And, and what was the most exciting uh, escapades that you got up to? Oh, you my now, goodness you me. Now. And well, now that you can talk about them, you see, because you you've uh, you've you've long since left. No one's going. No, you're not going to get into trouble now, Felicity, if you tell the rest of the world on this podcast. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it past me. Um, I mean, my goodness, yeah, I've had my car blown up by a bomb, by the way, in London. So, um, again, goodness knows why I said that, but yes, that happened in twenty. 21 i think in ealing there was actually a case of mistaken identity but as you can imagine that's that's a story in itself but um the, the worst the best i mean we got up to all sorts of things laura was a terrible influence although it was always perceived that i was the worst but she is more de- daredevilish than i am um we we swam across the seine once we were in a party in near the notre dame and in one of the apartments and I think we thought it would be fun to swim across obviously that is not a good idea it's a very stupid idea if my children do that I would ground them and they'd be in big trouble there's like (laughs) caniches you know or barges coming and all sorts and I guess it was midnight and cold and there's you know all of the above for those reasons why it's not a good idea but at the time it was I guess that's a pretty daredevilish thing that I don't think will get me into any trouble sharing? Anyway, let's move no. on. Let's get back to the no, arts. I don't, I don't think um, you're going to get into trouble now, although you might do in the summer if you try to do it during the Olympics. Yeah, they can might... you imagine? Yeah, I'd be in big trouble then. Uh, and so w- when you were in school then, did you have a sense of what you wanted to do when you were in Paris, of what you might want to do with your career? I mean, you studied politics and international Law now, where, where that was something that you thought would be a good foundation for a career, as your parents were guiding you towards that. But what did you think you might do with it? Um, why did I study that? I studied that because I was doing some model of the United Nations at the time with the British School of Paris, and uh, my boyfriend at the time was um, Indian and. I just loved, I mean, the school is just full of different, it's called the British school, but actually, you know, there's every nationality there. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't something that I thought there's a career. I just was interested in it. And it was the only thing other than art. I didn't really want to do French. Everybody kept telling me to do French. But then again, you know, when you grow up in an international environment, like most people speak five languages and, and even though my French is very good, it's it's not bilingual. And I always sort of, you know, that saying about being a fish in a small pond or a big fish in a small pond or the rest of it. So, so I, don't, I don't really want to do that. And um, and that was that. I did, I was massively into dance. I did like ballet, tap, jazz from a very young age. Um, and, and I, you know, loved it. I love drama, I love singing, you know, always been in a choir. So I guess that's where I wanted to go, um, like musical theatre. Um, but then when I got more into it, I didn't really 
I wasn't um musical theatre world is very it's very competitive and although I'm competitive in nature I wasn't sort of strong enough to have enough self-confidence that I could could go to, to that level and because I wanted to be best everything I kind of gave up that that um, avenue were you I, I, I didn't, yeah I didn't really know the whole I finished university and my father was um paying like an allowance and I finished uni and he said okay so what are you going to do what's what's your job and I said I don't know I have <laughs> I haven't found myself yet and he said well keep it you need to you have to get a job and I said oh, yeah I understand that but I don't know where I want to be and he said okay well you be what you want to be but I'm not paying for you anymore so you know no more money and that was it like it turned off the the tap of of the fund obviously i was incredibly lucky to have the fund in the first place but it was a very abrupt stop and um i just had to get a job and my dad a university i worked in jd sports selling trainers and then behind the bar in all sorts of clubs and things and dad said i'd probably be good at sales because i um i was getting tips for selling trainers which you know was unusual so um i had some interviews there was a local company a small company business partner um selling it software hardware and i got a job there and and then that's that's where my career went really where did it go from there uh well i'm now a regional vice president for salesforce which is a huge amazing company selling software across the world um and i run a team and uh, i don't know if you've heard of salesforce or a, a crm customer relationship management um platform initially and, and now we we cover applications across the board and ai you name it really integration etc it's very it so it's combining you know your your sales skills and your father's it background then yes i have followed my father 100% and and the secret of the the painting and the art over time has got bigger and bigger and bigger and it's you know not it's part of who i am i i am i am an artist whether or not i'm perceived to be an artist from the external world is is a whole other debate but i have now realized maybe 4 years ago that that i can embrace being an artist it is <laughs> Oh, what I want to say is that maybe I perceive the artist world to not be, you know, as academic and therefore not as as successful and and as a driven family. That's what I thought I needed to to do. So, so my company are actually incredibly supportive. They are very much aware of the fact that I need to paint every day otherwise I get the shakes and um they they encourage me and strangely enough because i do love people and because i do have a lot of energy and because i do love socializing and and um presenting and and strategizing that actually it's sort of a yin and yang because i get to throw myself out into to risky meetings complicated conversations and then on on the flip side i get to then have um the anecdote of being completely by myself in my studio painting for as long as i need or want and then and then i do it all over again and i guess as well i don't have the time to you know i i, I was listening to some of your podcasts and some of the questions around how do you get yourself motivated or how do you get in the mood to do art and i don't have that challenge because i just don't have the time i just sort of think okay i've got an hour now run quickly you can do you could start a good painting in an hour so quickly just get it done um and then my alarm will go off and i have to go and pick up my daughter from netball or something like that how do you divide your time then between a demanding job and art which seems to me to be a form of sort of mental therapy for you as well an essential one Yes, it is. It is. Um 
how do I divide my time? I guess I am in the moment. So if I'm at work, I'm very much at work. Mm, I'm pretty, I'm probably pretty good at doing, you know, nine till five. Whereas maybe some of my colleagues work unbelievable, ridiculous hours. I, again, I don't really have a choice because I know I need to paint to keep me sane. Um, And yeah, I mean, at some point, I think my dream will be to be a full-time artist. Um, but right now in the moment, I'm enjoying having two lives. Um, if that's probably really greedy. Um, but uh, do you know what is amazing? Because I have financial security, because I have uh, an amazing job, just get to paint what I want, when I want, how I want. Like there's no constraints. And sometimes I speak to artists and, you know, they have specific commissions or they have specific projects or, you know, they're concerned about money and, and, and that must be so stressful. Whereas painting like I do in the freedom that I do, you know, I'm very, very privileged from that perspective. I, I get like jealous every now and again when I see full-time artists just, I don't know, going on a plein air trip or, or doing some sort of project or exhibition. But in, in the great sort of swing of things, um, I'm happy with how I do balance my life. But the most important thing to me is my children. Um, my education was interesting through my own challenges. I am driven to pay for the best education that I can possibly get them. And if that means having two jobs or two careers, then, then that's, what, that's what I have to do. You have a daughter of, who's 13 years old, Annabelle, and then Charlie, yeah. your son, who's 11 years old. So very demanding ages. They're great kids. They're amazing. I can't believe they're mine, but they are. <laughs> they look really <laughs> similar, actually. It's quite funny. My sisters, we don't really look... I mean, we know we have similarities, but my son and my daughter, I think, look so similar. But then, obviously, one's, one's the male and one's the female. So I chuckle over that. So just going back to your schedule, because with a full-time nine-to-five job during the week, that means you must be painting evenings and weekends. Yeah. Is that a challenge with raising a family, having a husband and doing all the you know, family stuff as well? That must make it a pretty full 24 hours for you. Yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm always on. Um, I, I, now that I'm older, I realise that, yeah, I, so I don't watch TV. Um, the, the, the things around the sides of life, I tend to not do. Um, I don't drink alcohol at all anymore. So um, I'm quite strict with knowing what I what's right for me. So whilst I'll go out maybe for a work dinner, um, you know, I'll, I'll be drinking a Diet Coke and some water and the rest of it, which I enjoy again because I'm so hyper anyway, I get into the moment. But then I wake up in the morning, I'm fresh as a daisy and I'm ready to go. So I don't have any sort of off moments. So in the grand scale of things, that gives me back a lot more time than maybe one would assume. Um, the children are definitely older. So the whole like painting, drawing stuff, that completely stopped when they were babies. I mean, I would draw and paint them occasionally when they were asleep. If I got enough sleep, they were a nightmare. None of them slept, like unbelievably horrific. So I just press pause on life and and do and I can all the rest of it but now they're like they're so into their own lives like my son loves chess um he's a very happy boy he's got great school friends and all the rest of it so he's pretty much left his own devices like he is rubbish with homework that's pain in the ass but you know my husband and I are there behind him motivating him and my daughter is extremely um self-sufficient she is obsessed with netball she loves hockey she's very into sports so she plays i think every night bar one 
um, some sort of sport thing. And then she is very academic and um, likes to do her work. So, 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 so um, the most amazing person is, is Richard, my husband. He is, um, I mean, hands down, he's the best man in the whole wide world. Um, he is so supportive. Um, he does, we call it blue and pink jobs, you know, man jobs, women jobs. Um, and yeah, he does way beyond the, the blue jobs. Um, he's incredible cook. So in fact, it's funny, like when the kids were younger, you know, when children were growing up, they'd say, you know, what's for tea, mom? They wouldn't say that. They'd say, who's cooking dinner? Is it you or dad? And I'd be like, dad, they're like, oh, phew, my goodness for that. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, so very supportive family, children who are naturally, you know, happy disposition. Um, and then my husband, I mean, my husband and I have had many chats to, you know, I want to paint, I need to paint. Maybe I should go and do a degree in art because I'm not taught, you know, I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking of painting. I go to bed at night, I'm thinking of painting. If I'm having lunch for somebody, I'm looking at their face, working out what it would look like on the canvas. You know, I can't ignore that anymore. Um, but we discussed it. And actually what's right for me, we think, is to is to lead these two lives. And so I think that's probably the reason why he is so supportive, because he knows, you know, it's it's within me. Am I making any sense? Now, do your children um, have any interest in art at all? Do they watch you and see the energy that you put into it? Um, uh, yeah, they're interested. Um, I think they probably will be more interested in it when they get older and they're out from, you know, my my world, should we say. I think they, they dabble in it. Um, I think they both have good eyes. Um, I mean, my daughter's doing amazing work. She's what thirteen um, in her art classes, but she, she, I, I doubt that she'll do it for GCSE because she doesn't have. Maybe she will. I don't know. Is it? There must be some some sort of psychology, and you know, the fact that your mum's so obsessed about something, you might want to almost go the other way. Um, and then I think naturally, probably when she's a bit older, she'll, she'll come back to it. I'd love, I'd love art to be a bit more of a, a thing that adults pick up and do. Kind of, you see a lot of children drop it at a certain level, and then, and then they never pick it up again. I, you know, meet a lot of people at work when I talk about art. They say, "Oh, I used to love art at school." And you know, when was the last time you drew? Or you know, twenty years ago, it's like, "Oh, pick up a pencil." I'm like, "Oh, I, oh, I didn't think I could do that." Yeah. <laughs> Yes, you often hear that. Now, I just want to come back to your motives for the painting because you said how you can financially, you know, balance the two careers. You know, with making um, art uh, a, a, a profitable enterprise as well. But does it have to be commercial for you? Because when when you say you're expressing yourself, your ideas of what you want to paint, you you don't have any obligations for commissions. You can just go and paint what you want to paint. But do you go towards the easel thinking, okay, I've got to make money out of this. This has to be a commercial enterprise. Otherwise, it's just therapy. No, I don't have that. But I guess because I'm in a privileged position of having, having – um a salary through another means. Um, I do, unfortunately, I don't want to admit it, but I've started saying it, so I will. I do seek external validation. So whilst I'm not needing the money per se, I do sometimes think, oh, will people like this? Um, case in point, actually, I just did a painting recently that I like, but I'm not going to show it to anybody because I don't think it's something that people, other people will like. Um, so... I'll keep that to myself. So, so I guess that guides me. So that validation then is coming from uh, the admiration from the audience, so to speak. And I know you said that your goal is to make people feel good when they're looking at your paintings too. So in terms of the satisfying process of art and painting, where is the most satisfaction coming from? Uh, the most satisfaction is coming from truly painting and 
Yeah, it's the only it's the only time that I really feel at peace without sounding too oh, I don't know, corny or whatever it sounds like. I don't um there's so many challenges going on in the world. I feel very emotional towards the the you know, lives being lost, wars, political challenges. Um I worry about all sorts of things and it's only when I'm painting can I switch off. Even even sleep, you end up dreaming and then thinking about things. So so the most satisfaction comes from being in the moment, being present and and creating. I love that. Um and I feel like I'm doing something for a positive purpose. So that feels good. Like there's no ulterior motives. There's nothing that I'm doing that could could have a, a negative impact on, on other people, should we say. Um, maybe it could if I painted something they didn't like, but that's quite superficial at, at that level. Um, so that gives me, gives me me the most reward. And then again, something I think I mentioned, but um, I don't want, I, I really want to leave a legacy. Um, and I don't mean to sort of give myself... Um, Oh, I just don't want to be forgotten. I don't want it to all be worthless. I don't want to like die and then just for that to be that, move on, like here's the next. <laughs> so I figured if I can create a painting that will last the, the test of time and and have a meaning and a richness and a life experience. I have no idea what this painting is going to be, by the way, but but that's what I'm working towards. I keep, you know, so I keep on thinking and when I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, a bit like a magpie in terms of collecting all of these objects around me for still lives. And that's why I love symbolism. And because I'm constantly thinking of a painting or a series of paintings that will truly be remarkable so that it's not all for nothing. Just going back to the satisfying part about it, obviously the application of the art, but is there also uh, some sense of measure when you get your family's reaction to a piece, you know, and when Richard comes to look at it, whether he likes it or doesn't like it, does that impact you? Yeah, although um, I can't have Richard looking at paintings because he's just so, I mean, I mean, we are yin and yang. He's so serious. He is, uh, he's impossible to read. Um, yes, is good is what you'll get. And that probably means it's amazing <laughs> or it's crap. Like, you know, you're not really going to get, He's, you know, he's very horizontal, shall we say. Um, so he doesn't really get much of a look in in terms of asking for his opinion. He's more of a, a shoulder to lean on when it's when I think it's gone crap. Um, my mother has a very critical eye, but that's quite good because she's honest. Um, so that that has an impact. And then, oh, well. Uh, the, one of my personal ambitions is to get into or to become a member of, of one of the societies um, affiliated um, with British artists in, in London, in the Mall. So I submit regularly to the open calls and that determines my happiness for the year. Like how many, how many pieces did I get accepted into these exhibitions, these open calls? Um, so that gives me a higher level of satisfaction or a, a, a high level of disappointment. Um, but that is that is how I measure myself or, or measure how successful the year has been. That's your grading scale then, is it? Yes, yes. That, that external validation, yeah. Yes. Now, you mentioned earlier how much you enjoyed dance and music. So where does music play a role in your life now? Do you play music when you're painting? <laughs> I do. Um, my husband is a pianist. Uh, in fact, he can play everything and anything. We've got... <laughs> when my son was maybe... I don't even know if he was a year. He was very, very little, maybe nine months or something. It was my husband's birthday. And as a joke present, I bought him a desk set of drums, like, you know, miniature set of drums for him to take in the office. as was like a bit of fun. And, and again, he was quite serious. And he opened it and he goes, oh, I think you're right. I think it's time that I bought myself some drums. <laughs> like, what? 
<laughs> where did that come from um and it turns out i didn't actually know but it turns out that he played drums as a kid so he went out and bought himself so we've got drums on the hallway we've got we had an extension on the house made to fit in a grand piano for him um which is hilarious um and my son plays a cello and what other instruments like i think it's the trumpet or something richard also used to play or oboe oboe yeah we've got an oboe lying around and then we've got two guitars so yeah there's lots of lots of music going around um and then i just listen to current music or whatever that may be current pop music and then a bit of classical i like from from the ballet days so is that radio one or radio two Oh, it's uh, Alexa on Spotify. Oh, okay, okay, of course, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to getting your playlist because we know, you know, we do ask our guests to supply their playlist. Yes. Yeah. No, I think I sent that to you like seconds before this meeting, um, much later than you had asked for it. But yes, um, I think I th- hopefully you have it. Okay. And now, what about books? Because you know, being still is. It's sometimes a challenge for people with high energy. Painting does that for you. But do you find time to read at all? Yes, I read every day. I have to read to go to sleep. So I have a Kindle and um, I read myself to sleep. So, yeah, I read, read all the time. It's quite funny, actually. I did uh, an analysis. It's just popped into my mind. Um, must have been four years, three years ago. So I've had a Kindle for, let's say, 10 odd years. Can't remember how long. And I did a subject access request, the data subject access request from Amazon to give me all the information that they have on me. And they sent over these files and, you know, things that I buy, the money that... uh, So I then divided up the data and I had a look at what I spend money on. Now, obviously, I uh, spent a lot on art supplies and a lot on my kids' um, gifts and things. And then I, I got really into looking at the books because it showed how many books I was reading over the years. And it was quite consistent. I think it was something like 15 books a year for maybe nine years or something like that. I can't, I can't remember the exact numbers. And then COVID hit and it went into the 30s. Um, which I thought was a really interesting data point. So um, instead of going in and out of London, where, when COVID hit, I I didn't have that commute and I worked from home and uh, I read a lot more. So that's just interesting. I think I've gone off tangent again. I'm sorry, Chris. Subjects. What subjects would you be drawn to then? Fiction or nonfiction? Um, yeah, fiction... Uh, and any topic at the time that that uh, interests me. So oh, my son's really got into the immune system at the moment. So by virtue, I've got into dendritic cells and things like that. And then also, um, unfortunately, a friend has got cancer. They needed some money for some treatment. So I offered to shave my hair off for the treatment who, because, you know, work in a big company, lots of people would be interested, having a giggle at me with no hair. And so I really got into reading a lot about, um, you know, human biology and stuff like that. But just just varies, just uh, just reading anything, anything that's good, anything that is well written. I don't really mind about the subject as long as the sentences are constructed in powerful ways. I, you know what I dislike intensely is when I get spoon fed. I love... I love cliffhangers and and the the sort of open possibilities in sentences. I love books that don't have an ending. Well, you're certainly writing your own story, and one of the I think uh, landmarks milestones, I should say, in your story seems to be the one that we've skipped over very lightly, and that was the car blowing up in South London. Oh Do you want to yeah, tell us it more wasn't about that. Yeah, I mean, it actually wasn't that much. It's just a funny, it's not funny. It's, I know it's attention grabbing because I know it's attention grabbing. I went to an interview once and 
I went and sat down and the the man, the interviewee said to me, right, you've got 10 minutes. Tell me about yourself and keep me interested. And that was sort of his interview technique. And so I started by going through my CV. I then touched upon my education. I talked about sports. At the time, I think I was still hiding the fact that I was an artist. And so that didn't come up. And then he wasn't really paying any attention. And I thought, I haven't got the job. So I thought, what can I say? And I thought, oh, I'll just go for it. So I said, oh, you know, a few weeks ago, somebody blew up my car with a bomb. And his reaction was shock, horror. Oh, my goodness, no way. And he looked up and then I thought, oh, my goodness, isn't karma a weird thing? Like, who would have thought that having your car blown up by a bomb would then get you a job in a roundabout way? But, yeah, um, it was a mistaken identity. I've moved to London with my mates from university and my cousin, and we were in li living in South Ealing. And um, my car was parallel parked outside, and I was actually ill that day. I was supposed to go... I was doing kickboxing at the time, one of my fleeting passions. And um, I'd gone to bed and then my housemates woke up, they woke me up screaming saying, you know, bless your car's on fire. And I was like, no, it's not. And then, yeah, and then it was, which, which is, it was, it was terrifying at the time. Obviously, everybody's safe, nobody got hurt. So it's an interesting conversation now. At the time, I don't know if you've ever seen a car like on fire, like a ball of fire, but it's um, it was incredibly scary because the two, the the chairs, the seats, um, they look eerily like you know they got the form of a of a of a of a body, and they kept because I was I had a really really bad cold, and I'd just woken up, and I wasn't really compass mentis, and they were saying, "Yes, you know, it's you, it's your your car," and I was like, "I'm not in the car," um, is what I remember most, and then. Um, and then the engine blew and then the two cars next to it then caught on fire and then we had a couple of um, um, fire engines come and, and all the neighbours saying, well, we've never seen this before. We've never had this. It is an incident yeah. of interest and it is a point of, because not everybody, uh, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. Like it's not, not everyone's seen no. their car being blown up. So I can imagine why it would catch people's attentions. Yeah. And then did they find out who caused it? Who dropped the yes, bomb? Yes, it, yeah, it was it was gang related, and it was a mistaken identity. Okay. Any other wonderful milestones in your life that we should know about Felicity? Um. Uh, well, wonderful might not be the 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 term, but yeah, no, there's a huge. I mean, I am partly defined by. Um. <laughs> Uh, you've got to tell me when to stop talking, by the way, because um, I don't know. Um, um, so when I was 14, we moved to France and we didn't speak French and I wore train tracks and um, we... Train track, is, train track is what? Uh, braces, sorry, or braces. And we went to see an orthodontist and um, he suggested an operation which... I should, we should have never have done um, and I had an operation and he did things that he shouldn't have done and he made some big mistakes and as a result um, it uh, he cut the main blood supply to my mouth and whilst he patched me up or thought he patched me up um, he actually never did properly so uh, over the next sort of six months when I was healing um, I wasn't actually healing. I'd, it, I had bone necrosis, which is basically effectively when bone dies because there's no blood supply going to it. So parts of my jaw, my the palate, um, bone around my teeth, all, all just slowly died over the course of uh, over the course of about yeah, six months to a year. I'm not quite sure actually. And um, I still had the braces in. It turns out. Um, that the braces were keeping my teeth in because there was no bone around the the teeth. <laughs> and um, and I, I remember eating a Milky Way sort of part on one side of the mouth that wasn't too, you know, damaged. And then it was weird as well because I was a vegetarian, so I don't really know why I thought it was a chicken bone, but I thought it was a chicken bone and I pulled out chicken bone. It actually wasn't the chicken bone. It was the roof of my mouth a part of the roof of my mouth 
that um because the gum the gum had never healed over it um and it basically completely died so i pulled that out and then there was just a gaping between my nasal cavity and my mouth and just just a big old hole so um so yeah, i would drink eat it would come up my nose um and then to cut a long story short basically people in so still living in france but there were doctors and surgeons in Guy's, St. Thomas's and King's and through various different reasons, they got together and my mom would like take me over to England for, you know, major maxofacial reconstruction surgery. And I would have an operation and then I would come back to France and then I'd go back to school healing. Again, this is the British school of Paris. They were amazing. They, let me, you know, I had a lot of time off school um, with different appointments and things. Um, and the kids as well were amazing. Like when I look back, like like everybody was nice to me. Like not nice, sickening nice because they felt sorry for me. Obviously, a lot of people did feel sorry for me because at times I didn't have half a face, you know, I looked like a right weirdo. Um, but nobody, you know, every, everybody was just very... I guess we all had a, a, a childish um, faith. I certainly had a, a confidence that it would all be fixed one day. And so therefore, even though it was horrific and there were so many tears cried and, you know, the world ended on multiple occasions, I kind of deep down knew it would be okay. And it is okay. And I look perfectly fine and you would never know any, I don't look any different. Well, I kind of do if I laugh a lot because I don't have, um, I have implants now. So I had two bone grafts, so both my hips, they took bone from that to rebuild the mouth and also this is why I love art because I don't know if you've ever been seriously ill but when you're when you're really ill when you're sort of bedridden even watching tv hurts you know if you're if you're in pain um even um like even reading was was too much I think nowadays it'd be a lot easier actually because you've obviously got Alexa and things like that but but at the time, I was very sensitive to noises and and textures and things like that. And I was very sensitive because I was, I guess, like, you know, not depressed, but sometimes feeling very sorry for myself. So drawing was always my comfort blanket because it was me and my pencil and my notepad and that was all I needed. You know, there was, I could do it at any time. Sometimes I you know, would wake up all sorts of times in the night um, for different reasons and things. So that's, you know, art is just the best thing in the whole wide world as far as I'm concerned for, for lots of different reasons. So yeah, so that was a pretty huge, um, huge milestone. Um, but it's, it's life. Everybody has to go through their thing, right? Well, I think another milestone, uh, in, a, in a way, has been this Ukrainian war that we're subjected to. It seems to be that you have a sensitivity to war and the uh, external, you know, foreign politics particularly, and the catastrophe that that could unveil with all of this. And art is, again, your salvation. But the one thing you have done, uh, you had told me, is that you did take in a Ukrainian family. So I'd imagine that was of some comfort to you, to be able to do that. Yes. Oh, my God, I love them so much. Uh, Diana and Yesenia and uh, husband Max. Um, Yesenia is the daughter. Diana is the is the mum. And the bloody dog, Dexter, who I don't love, but that's just funny because we got three cats. We used to have a dog, but that's another story. So, um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, they, yes, I am sensitive. Yes, I do want to help. And yes, we're we're privileged. So I was quite nervous to say to my husband, Oh Richard, I really, I really want to help and maybe we could take on a family. Because I thought he would say, Oh, God bless, you know, not another idea. Because beforehand I was, I also wanted to adopt and foster and things and and he said we weren't ready. And I think that's correct. I think we have to wait till we're a bit older and the uh, my you know, our children have moved out and things like that. Um anyway, uh he surprised me completely. He said, Oh, I think it's a great idea. I would love to do that. And then we had some friends also in Fleet that were doing it and 
And as soon as I found out that we had friends doing it, I didn't feel so harebrained and, and alone in, in, in doing it. And then we found a family on LinkedIn um, and Diana, we got speaking to her. And I mean, she is the most incredible woman in the whole world. Like I have learned so much from her. Um, she she didn't know us from Adam. She trusted, <sighs> couldn't get their dog over and the dog meant a lot to them. So my husband, Richard, ended up actually having to drive to France to pick them up, to drive them back. Um, and so, you know, she, she left her home. She, she, her daughter and her dog came to live with, with us. So we could have been anybody, but, you know, her circumstances dictated she didn't have a lot of choice. And um, they lived with us for nearly a year and it was, it was sad, happy, you know, it's sort of been the worst and best times of, of my life. Um, uh, I, I can't say there'd be any really good times for her as such, other than that we, we now have a very special relationship. They've moved out now, they live down the road um, in a house nearby. Um, I don't actually see them that much because if it's not painting and it's not my job, then it doesn't really get a look in. Although I did do a lot of painting with Yesenia, with the, with the, with the daughter, with the girl. And um, yeah, uh, was it, is it a milestone in my life? Yes. Do I, I mean, I think as people, as humans, we all wake up every morning and we all want to try and do our best and we all make mistakes. And I think what upsets me about war is that I'm an adult and I should be able to have some control over over you know these horrific things that are happening to people um that that maybe one or two people have decided you know or these just the horrendous implications um so I get very frustrated by that. And if I'm doing something, it, I tend to feel a little less frustrated because I feel like I'm, I'm helping. But then that gets me into all sorts of trouble. I've done a few paintings and put them out there that maybe are political and then I get, I get some horrible backlash. So I don't really do that. I mean, I do, do, I do drawings and stuff at home, but I don't share them anymore because I don't, I'm a people pleaser and I don't want people not liking me. <laughs> I'm not brave like some artists out there that just just put it all out there. So what does 2024 hold in store for you, Felicity? What 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 are you looking forward to? What's on your bucket list this year? Um I'm working towards something that is unbelievably exciting, but I again I'm not brave enough to share what it is because it might not happen and then then I'll be really embarrassed because that would be awkward. <laughs> Um, so what I do every year is I sit down and I look about the year ahead and I think about what I'd like to paint and I look at the open calls and the shows and then I align that with my work calendar or my diary and I set out a plan and then I go towards that um, it's a bit like a New Year's resolutions really just a little bit more structured um, so I will keep doing what I'm doing. I will paint every day. I will continually be thinking about what a future masterpiece could look like. Um, I keep a diary, I write a diary most days. Um, and I'll continue to learn, like, you know, learn, teach myself, do the odd courses, um, and try and capture these special fleeting moments or objects that that hold other people's memories and, and um, yeah, create create art. What are you most proud, proud of at this point? Um, from what perspective? Any perspective. So from, like, my family or from an art perspective? Any perspective. <laughs> oh, what am I most proud of? Yeah, I'm pretty proud of me. Um, considering we're talking about me, I've definitely had some challenges and I've 
I'm feeling proud because I think I've worked myself out a bit. I've been very confused for a lot of my life. And I feel in the in the past few years, you know, like I'm I'm who I am at work, which is an amazing place to be, and I'm who I am with my art, which is an amazing place to be. I could be a better mom. Um, I could give them more time. But in a really weird way, I'm a happier person by doing as much painting as I do. So I'm the best mum I can be um, in in um, in that respect. Um, and I just want my children to grow up and, and, and live their life and their path, whatever that may be. Not necessarily, you know, I don't need them to be happy. They may not be, um, if that's not what they want, but I'd like them to be content with their choices. Um, so in the future, if you were to ask me what am I most proud of, I, I would like to think it would be my children for figuring themselves out and for doing what they feel is what's right for them, just like I feel like I'm finally doing for myself. The journey continues, Felicity, and I wish you well with it. Thank you, too, for coming on the show and sharing so much of it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great. And you can visit Felicity's Gallery online and also on social media. Just follow the link in the show notes. And whilst you're on Facebook and Instagram, do give us a follow and leave your comments and questions and also suggestions for guests. As you know, we always love to hear from you. Any feedback about the show, which has now boosted us to the top 20% in global podcast stats. So that's pretty amazing for such a young podcast. And that's all thanks to you. Well, next week, my guest is someone who's going to make your mouth water. Her name is Anna Eccles, and she's a cake artist. So join me next week here on the Art Podcast as we get to know Anna. And you might want to have a cup of tea in hand. Mm -hmm.